Oh, hello everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Console Log. This is a brand new episode for your own entertainment. This is the episode number 41. We are on our way towards the big five zero zero. <laughs> In other news this week, I'm very excited to start playing Mario Tennis. Ow, I'm very excited to be playing Mario Tennis. It has been on my anticipated list for quite a while and it finally came today and this episode almost didn't happen because I was just gonna play Mario Tennis all weekend but I can't do that I can't do that to you you need to know what's going on in the world of JavaScript I mean that's why you're here right you want to know what's going on this past week because if you don't know what's going on then how will you actually program actually this show doesn't really help you program but it helps you be aware what things that you can program so uh, let me start talking it's episode number 41 June 18th through June 24th, and let's get this show on the road. So there was a big blog post this past week from Airbnb about how they are no longer using React Native at Airbnb. Well, they're sunsetting their usage of React Native. And the reason why this is a big deal is because Airbnb was actually one of the first companies, one of the first big companies to actually What's the word? What's the word? Champion of React Native. And the fact that they are now no longer using it is a little bit shocking, I think, to the community. They have a five-part blog series, which you can read in detail, but suffice it to say, the too long didn't read is that they already have a very large iOS and Android team, and they weren't really making the best use of that team. They, that team didn't, need to, didn't really want to learn React Native and JavaScript. They already knew iOS and Native. And the long story short is that React Native was not the best tool for Airbnb, which isn't to say that React Native isn't good enough for a company, it's just not good enough for Airbnb itself. Uh, there's a big company in the ecosystem called Expo, which does a lot of awesome work with React Native, and the founder, one of the founders of React uh, of Expo, the person, uh, Charlie Cheever, actually had a great blog post talking about the hardships that uh, different teams can, different companies can have implemented React Native, and I think it's a great read. He outlined three three personality types. One is if it's a brand new application that you just want to stay within JavaScript, that's great for uh, for React Native. If you want to add new screens that are entirely in React Native, that that is a great usage. However, if you already have an existing application and you have an existing iOS and Android uh, dev teams, that's probably not the best use. React Native, React Native will probably not be the best use for you there. But in any case, it's interesting to see trends in the ecosystem. I wouldn't read too much into this because React Native still is pretty damn great. They're investing even more time into it, as I mentioned last week. They're doing a whole big refactor of the React Native cores and fabric. So don't worry, uh, but it's always interesting to see the pain points that big companies experience when using new technologies. Have you ever checked out the website for the console log? It's a pretty damn cool website if I uh, do say so myself. I even designed it and I am not a designer, so if you like the design, thank you so much. The website of the console log is powered by this, by this uh, uh, software called Gatsby. And I've talked about Gatsby in the past, and the reason why I'm bringing Gatsby up right now is because this past week, Gatsby officially launched their beta for version two, which I'm very excited about because there's some really sweet new features in this new version. Namely, they've now upgraded Babel to version 7, the latest version of Babel, even though Babel version 7 is not yet final out. That's a whole separate story. But they also have upgraded React from 15 to 16. And even better, probably the best news, is they've upgraded to Webpack 4.0. And there are many performance improvements that come with Webpack 4.0. Along with these upgrades, they've also done some good work on refining the API for Gatsby. So it should be a little bit more intuitive and less gotchas when you start using the API. For example, they got rid of a layout component. You knew Gatsby, you know what that is. But suffice it to say, Gatsby now is simpler. I'm hoping to actually upgrade the console log website to Gatsby version 2.0 beta. Maybe make a little video out of it, maybe not. But if you do want to have a static site, Gatsby is a great place to start. So I'm so happy that Node 10.5 came out this past week because it allows me to talk about something that I've pushed off for, I think, three weeks now. I've been wanting to talk about this. They had a PR open for Node for a while ago about this adding uh, this threading support to Node. And I had it three weeks ago and I wanted to talk about it, but it got kind of bumped off because other things happened in news. And then last week, other things bumped it down in news. But finally, I actually have a real reason to talk about it because now you can actually use it in Node 10.5. And it's this PR that adds threading support to Node itself. It's in 10.5 behind an experimental flag. So to use it, you have to use Node dash dash the flag name. 
And what's exciting about this is that it actually adopts some of the APIs that you'd use in the web browser when communicating to a web worker so that you can actually offload heavy processes in your node process to a different thread. And you can do child processes right now in Node. Those are much more heavier than this worker thread implementation, but it's pretty great that it's building on top of the uh, message channel web API. It's also doing similar things to the post message API that you use between a web worker and your main UI thread in the browser. So if you do use Node, this is not gonna be a first class way to actually do threading in Node. I mean, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, but now you also have that choice to actually make that responsible, powerful choice. But uh, it's really exciting. Just it shows node maturing. This was entirely done by I think an outside contributor as well. It's a whole big PR you can look at, and it's going to hopefully make some node applications faster because they can actually split up the work. Oh, maybe even for tests. Oh, making tests faster would that be so cool? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I might actually start experimenting with this. Hopefully I have time to finish this episode. And last but not least, I've talked about Houdini so many times in this channel. I am so excited about Houdini. I need to make its own episode about Houdini because just the ramifications of this technology I think are way underappreciated. Essentially Houdini is a brow is Babel for CSS. Easiest way to explain it. However, because you can't really transpile CSS down, it's actually creating APIs in the browser that you can then extend the capabilities of CSS. And this past week, there was a demo that was released uh, by some Google engineers, and they implemented using the Houdini Custom Layout API, which is a API part of Houdini that lets you actually customize how things are laid out on the page, where they actually implemented a constraints-based layout. And that's a very fancy term. They have a video showing the flexibility of it, but why I'm excited about that is that is actually constraints-based layout, like you have Flexbox and Display Block, but a constraints-based layout is how iOS actually allows you to lay out content in your iOS applications. And constraints-based is pretty much saying that if you have a div on a web page, you can say that a, another div is constrained to appear on the bottom right side of that other div. And you can kind of build these rules that describe how your content is laid out on the page. Is this pragmatic? Are you actually gonna use this? No, but the fact that you can actually implement this with the Houdini API is very, very cool. Uh, imagine that you've ever used masonry in the past where you can have things laid out really um, dynamically. That can be built into the browser itself. So instead of doing display block, you could do display masonry. That's so cool. It's still a little bit ways to go. It's not really widespread yet. You can't really shim it unless you have some heavy JavaScript, I imagine, to shim it. But this demo just, again, showing the power that Houdini will have going forward. And that was your week of news from the console log, episode number 41. Uh, I'm going to be really busy playing this game all weekend. I have no plans except with my Nintendo Switch, this game, and Final Cut Pro to edit this video. Uh, I hope if you do have this game, we can kind of compare notes. If you do have this, let me know in the comments. I just got the first Power Stone. I was actually gonna play all evening. Then I was like, hey, let's record the console log because if I don't do that now, I don't think I'd ever do that. So uh, that's good that I have that self-control to be able to record this film. So I hope you enjoyed this week of news. Let me know what you think about it in the comments, and I'll talk to you again next week. Bye-bye.